Chapter 5, Instant of the Letter. As you go through this chapter, keep an eye out for the kind of language that Stevenson uses and also the way that it changes from its normal, very dry, lawyer-esque kind of tone to being quite decadent and quite uh, poetic with its flourishes with regard to description and the way that things are set out. It was late in the afternoon when Mr Utterson found his way to Dr Jekyll's door where, at once, where he was at once admitted by Poole and carried down by the kitchen offices and across a yard which had once been a garden to the building which was indifferently known as the laboratory or dissecting rooms. Look at the build-up of setting here. In contrast, the two rooms between Jekyll and Hyde, the decadent, respectable, and then the laboratory. The doctor had bought the house from the heirs of a celebrated surgeon, and his own tastes being rather chemical than anatomical, sorry, chemical than anatomical, had changed the destination of the block at the bottom of the garden. It was the first time that a lawyer had been received in that part of his friend's quarters, and he eyed the dingy, windowless structure with curiosity and gazed round with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theatre, once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent, the tables laden with chemical apparatus, the floor strewn with crates and littered with packing straw, and the light falling dimly through the foggy cupola. It's like, it's like, a cupola is like uh, the roof base, type of roof basically, that light can come in of. At the further end, a flight of stairs mounted to a door covered with a red base, and through this, Mr. Utterson was at last received into the doctor's cabinet. It was a large room fitted with round glass presses, furnished, among other things, with a cheval glass and a business table, and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. The fire burned in the grate. A lamp was set lighted on the chimney itself, for even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly, and there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll, looking deathly sick. He did not rise to meet his visitor, but held out a cold hand and bade him welcome in a changed voice. Look at all the description there. To be getting your A's and B's, you really want to be going back through this paragraph and picking out certain elements of it, which give us a real side to the, a real idea of the side to Dr. Jekyll and the way he lives. The idea there as well, uh, shovel glass, which is uh, a long full body mirror. And the core by three dusty windows barred with iron. What kind of atmosphere does this create for the reader? It's certainly ideas of impression and confinement. It's like a prison cell basically it makes us think of. And now, said Mr Utterson, as soon as Poole had left them, you have heard the news? The doctor shuddered. They were crying it in the square, he said. I heard them from my dining room. One word, said the lawyer. Carew was my client, but so are you, and I want you to know what I am doing. You have not been mad enough to hide this fellow. Oh, sorry. Uh, you have not been mad, uh, mad enough to hide this fellow. Utterson, I swear to God, cried the doctor. I swear to God I will never set eyes on him again. I bind my honour to you that I am done with him in this world. This world. It is all at an end, and indeed he does not want any help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe. He is quite safe. Mark my words. He will never more be heard of. The lawyer listened gloomily. He did not like his friend's feverish manner. You seem pretty sure of him, he said. Uh, he, said he. And for your sake, I hope you might be right. If it came to trial, your name might appear. The idea of the importance of reputation. Utterson, a good religious man, is prepared to essentially lie for the honour of his friends and to preserve not only Jekyll's, rep uh, sorry, Jekyll's reputation, but also Utterson's. If Jekyll's found guilty of these crimes, Utterson's reputation also gets damaged. I am quite sure of him, replied Jekyll. I have grounds for certainty that I cannot share with anyone. But there's one thing on which you may advise me. I have... I have received a letter and I am at a loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson. You would judge wisely, I am sure. I have so great a trust in you. You fear, I suppose, that it might lead to his detection, said the lawyer. No, said the other. I cannot say, th I cannot say that I care what becomes of Hyde. I am quite done with him. 
I was thinking of my own character, which this hateful business has, and the idea of uh, public versus pub, uh, private lives. Many powerful people, uh, many powerful people, what well, the image they, they convey to the public is different in their private lives. The duality of man, if you like, and the idea of reputation. I was thinking of my own character, my own reputation, which this hateful business has rather ha exposed. Exposed, a key word choice there on exposed. It has exposed this, ho this um, horrible side of um, this hateful business of Jekyll's character, uh, which obviously suggests that within all of us there is this hateful side, this horrible evil side. Utterson ruminated a while. He was surprised at his friend's selfishness and yet relieved by it. Well, said he at last, let me see the letter. The letter was written in an odd, upright hand and signed Edward Hyde, and it signified briefly enough that the writer's benefactor, Dr. Jekyll, whom he had long so unworthily repaid for a thousand generosities, need labour under no alarm for his safety, as he had means of escape on which he placed a sure dependence. Look at here, although it's an anonymous narrator, told through the, f the perspective of Poole here, it's really, um, sorry, sorry, of Utterson here, it's a really um, important way the narrative is written. Stevenson's really cleverly using the anonymous narrator through the eyes of the viewpoint of Utterson to really make us feel that Jekyll is a great man. A thousand generosities he has bestowed upon this character, this horrible, hateful character, Edward Hyde. And it's really painting Jekyll out to be a great man. It's exposing his, his reputation to us. The lawyer liked this letter well enough. It put a better colour on the intimacy that he had looked for, and he blamed himself for some of his past suspicions. So even Utterson's feeling bad here were being told by the narrator. Have you the envelope? he asked. I burned it, replied Jekyll, before I thought that, uh, that uh, what I was about. But it bore no postmark. The note was handed in. It was handed in to the house. Shall I keep this and sleep upon it? asked Utterson. I wish you to judge it for me entirely, was the reply. I have lost confidence in myself. Well, I shall consider, returned the lawyer. And now, one word more. It was Hyde who dictated the terms in your will about the disappearance. The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You had a fine escape. And again here, we're being, Utterson's exposing this side, you know, Jekyll, poor, poor old Mr. Doctor, poor old Dr. Jekyll, who's being exploited by this horrible young man, Mr. Hyde. The idea is young as well is important in this, uh, the youngness of, his, of, of evil within the character. Very important here, and the idea that Utterson will, even now, he will defend his friend to the end, his character as well. And he says, you know, you must have, he went to murder you. I have had what is far more to the purpose, returned the doctor solemnly. I have had a lesson. Oh God, Utterson, uh, what a lesson I have had. And he covered his face for a moment with his hands. On his way out, the lawyer stopped and had a word or two with Poole. By the by, he said, there was a letter handed in today. What was the messenger like? What was the person who delivered the letter like? But Poole was positive nothing had come except by post. And only circulars by that, he added, only common things are distributed around the neighbourhood. This news sent the visitor off with his fears renewed. Plainly the letter had come by the laboratory door, possibly indeed it had been written in the cabinet, and if that were so, it must be differently judged and handled with more caution. So what, what it's saying there is that... Um, Poole has not seen anybody hand a letter in. Dr. Jekyll earlier on told us that the letter had been hand-delivered. Well, Poole, the, his, his butler, is saying, no, there's been nobody handing any sort of letter. And this then makes Utterson suspicious. The newsboys, as he went, were crying themselves hoarse along the footways. Special edition, shocking murder of an MP. That was a funeral oration of one friend and client. That is Dr. Jekyll's cat, just meowing in the background. Chill out, Jekyll. Don't show your height. Poole, the butler here, is confirmed, obviously, as explained there, and this computer artist then begins to wonder, and an MP is a member of Parliament, an elected politician. So, obviously, this murder of uh, Sir Danvers Carew, a politician, has had great ramifications. It's huge news. 
Imagine if a big Spanish politician or a British politician was to be murdered, it would make headline news. And this is showing how important this is and also how daring, how, how, how dangerous a person Hyde is because he's willing to do it to one of the most famous people in the country. So, um, special edition Sockham of an MP was a funeral oration of one friend and client and he could not help a certain apprehension lest the good name of another should be sucked down into the eddy of the scandal. So he doesn't want Jekyll to be brought into it. It was at least a ticklish decision that he had to make and self-reliant as he was by habit, he began to cherish a longing for advice. He wished he could speak to somebody else. It was not to be had directly, but perhaps he thought it might be fished for. He might be able to speak to somebody and fish out the information. He really doesn't want Jekyll to be caught in with this at all. And again, think about the idea of him being a good Christian man and he's prepared to lie, hide something from the police to conceal and to cover the reputation of his friend and client. Presently after, he sat on one side of his own hearth. Sorry, I'm just going to go back a minute. That's also important there, the idea of one friend and client. One friend and client. Not only does uh, Utterson see him as a friend first, he secondly does see him as a client. And it's this idea of his reputation. Uh, Jekyll is a client of the lawyer and he has to look after that as well. So presently after he went to find advice, he sat on one side of his own hearth with Mr Guest, his head clerk, upon the other and midway between a nice, at a nicely calculated distance, a hearth just being the floor of a fireplace, uh, at a nicely calculated distance from the fire, a bottle of a particular old wine that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of his house. So this guy uh, is a, a head clerk, a clerk is a, is a banker, and so um, he's got him involved. The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city, where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles, and through the muffle and smother of those fallen clouds, the procession of the town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries with a sound, sound of a mighty wind. Again, the, obviously the weather here beginning to have an influence and setting in what might happen. And again, this is... sorry. This is really important as well. It's a really nice line there, the idea that the fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city. Um, but as the room was gay with firelight, in the, bottle of the, in the bottle the acids were long ago resolved. The imperial dye had softened with time as the colour grows richer in stained windows and the glow of hot autumn afternoons on hillside vineyards was ready to be set free and disperse the fogs of London. Insensibly, the lawyer melted. There was no man from whom he kept fewer secrets than Mr Guest, and he was not always sure that he kept as many as he meant. Guest had often been on business to the doctors. He knew Poole. He could scarce have failed to hear of Mr Hyde's familiarity about the house. He might draw conclusions. Was it not as well, then, that he should see a letter which put that mystery to right? And above all, since Guest, being a great student and critic of handwriting, would consider the, the step natural and obliging, the clerk, his clerk besides, was a man of counsel. He could scarce read so strange a document without dropping a remark, and by that remark, Mr. Utterson might shape his future discourse. This is a sad business about Sir Danvers, he said. Yes, sir, indeed. It has elicited a great deal of public feeling, returned Guest. The man, of course, was mad. I should like to hear your views on that, replied Utterson. I have a document here in his handwriting. It is between ourselves, for I scarce know what to do about it. It is an ugly business at the best. But there, there it is, quite in your way, a murderer's autograph. So it's a, it's a letter from Hyde, obviously. Guest's eyes brightened, and he sat down at once and studied it with passion. No, sir, he said, not mad, but it is an odd hand. And by all accounts, a very odd writer, added the lawyer. Just then the servant entered with a, with a, with a note. Is that from Dr. Jekyll, sir? inquired the clerk. The clerk. I thought I knew the writing. Anything private, Mr. Utterson? Only an invitation to dinner. Why? Do you want to see it? One moment, I thank you, sir. And the clerk laid the two sheets of paper alongside and sedulously, uh, and sedulously compared their contents. Thank you, sir, he said at last, returning both. It's a very interesting autograph. There was a pause, during which Mr. Utterson struggled with himself. Why did you compare them, Guest? he inquired suddenly. Well, sir, returned the clerk, 
there's a rather singular resemblance. The two hands are in many points identical, only differently sloped. Meaning that the hand rating are identical, although instead of sloping to the right, one of them slopes to the left instead. But they're very similar handwriting, well, the same kind of handwriting, identical, we're told. It is, as you say, rather quaint, returned guest. I wouldn't speak of this note, you know, said the master. No, sir, said the clerk. I understand. I understand the importance to keep Dr. Jekyll's reputation. But no sooner was Mr. Hudson alone that night than he locked the note into his locked the note into his safe, where it reposed from that time forward. What he thought, Henry Jekyll forged for a murderer, and his blood ran cold in his veins. So Utterson has found, has had this letter. He's read it, and the letter obviously is some sort of con uh, some sort of confession, and in it saying that he's left for that Hyde has left forever. He won't be returning and he won't be bothering Jekyll again. And what Utterson's done, he's found that peculiar, especially because the pool, uh, that pool told him that no, no note had been handed in. So what he did was he went to his friend clerk, clerk, his, his clerk, Mr. Guest, and got him to study the handwriting, as he's a handwriting expert. The handwriting expert has discovered that the handwriting is identical, only instead of what, instead one faces to the right, and one slopes to the, uh, one slopes to the right, and one slopes to the left. Uh, this is interesting. Utterson now, the logical part of him has thought that he is obviously, Jekyll is now forging for a murderer. He's trying to cover up uh, what a, murder has, a murderer has done. He's trying to make it out as if Hyde is gone. So this raises Utterson's suspicions even more. Utterson obviously believes that Hyde obviously has made Dr. Jekyll do this in some way or other. But now there's elements of doubt beginning to creep into his mind.